Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus. Now in today's part 15 we will introduce the so-called multi-index notation for partial derivatives. But before we start with that, I really want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. And please don't forget to download the PDF version and the quiz for this video with the link in the description. Okay, then to start the video, let's recall how we denote partial derivatives in multivariable calculus. There we use this curve D and the order of the partial derivative is denoted with an upper index. Moreover, you also already know we use this Leibniz notation that looks like a fraction. And then in the denominator we find the variables for the partial derivative. Moreover, there we use a power notation to denote how many times we form the partial derivative with respect to the variable x2 in this case. Also, you know we read this from right to left, which means first we form the partial derivative with respect to x2, then also to x2 and in the end with respect to x1. And finally, the point where this partial derivative is evaluated at is denoted with parentheses afterwards. Okay, so in summary you see this is a partial derivative for a function f defined on Rn. Moreover, usually we have the values in R. Now at this point it's also helpful to recall Schwarz's theorem which tells us that the order for the partial derivatives here does not matter in the case that f is differentiable enough. More precisely, we need that the higher order partial derivatives of f all exist and form continuous functions. Then you are able to shift dx1 here to the right without changing anything. And indeed, because of this fact, we could shorten the whole notation here. And that's a good thing for theorems and formulas later, because they look much nicer if we have a compact notation for partial derivatives. For this reason, we will now introduce the multi-index notation. In order to do this, we first have to define what we mean when we say multi-index. More precisely, we will always have an n-dimensional multi-index, where n is the number of variables for the function f. And now this multi-index is simply an n-dimensional vector we call alpha. However, the components of this vector should be given by natural numbers. And most importantly, also zero as a number is allowed here. So you see, alpha is simply an n-tuple where the components are non-negative integers. So you see, this is not complicated at all, but this is what we call a multi-index in multivariable calculus. Moreover, the components here we simply call alpha1, alpha2 and so on. This is important because of course we will use the components a lot. We see this immediately when we look at the following important notations. The first thing you should learn here is the absolute value, the length of a multi-index. It's an easy definition because it's simply the sum of all components. In fact, this will be very helpful to describe the order of the partial derivative. However, the multi-index notation is also useful if you just deal with a vector x in Rn. Because there we can simply define x to the power alpha. So we have a vector in Rn and the exponent is a multi-index alpha. And now we simply define this as a product of normal powers. This means first we have the component x1 to the power alpha1. So this is a normal real number to the power of a natural number or zero. So you see this is indeed well defined. And then we just continue and multiply this with the next one x2 to the power alpha2. And then of course this whole product continues until we have the last component xn. Hence, you should see here, we can use the multi-index notation to describe a polynomial in several variables. Indeed, you might already know, in the end we want to be able to describe the Taylor polynomial for a function f from Rn to R. And exactly for this reason, we also need the factorial for a multi-index. And maybe not so surprising, this is defined by using the factorials of the components. So we have a 1 factorial times a 2 factorial and so on. Again, you see this is simply a product of natural numbers again. 
Okay, now in the same sense, you can also generalize the binomial coefficients for multi-indices. However, we will not need that in the next videos, but I can still show you the definition. So what we have here are two multi-indices of the same dimension, alpha and beta. And then we can define the generalized binomial coefficient as alpha over beta. And now since we already have the definition of the factorial, we can simply use that here. So as you know, we have a fraction where we have alpha factorial in the numerator and two different factorials in the denominator. Namely, it's alpha minus beta factorial, where the difference between two multi-indices is simply defined component-wise. So you simply subtract here as you would subtract vectors. Therefore, it's really important here that the two multi-indices have the same number of components. Okay, then back to the denominator here, where we have a second factorial. And you might already know, this should be beta factorial as for the normal binomial coefficient. Okay, and with this you see, we can introduce a lot of notations here for multi-indices, which will make a lot of formulas shorter. And of course, it's always good to have compact formulas. I would say, then they are much easier to remember. So now finally, the next notation is a capital D to the power alpha. This is D alpha we apply to our function f. And you might already guess, this D here stands for differentiation. So it's a short notation we can use for the partial derivative. And maybe you already know which partial derivative it should define here. Namely, on the left, we have the partial derivative with respect to the first component x1, alpha 1 times. And then to the right of that, we have the next component x2. And this one now, alpha 2 times. And then we simply continue until we have the nth component xn. And of course, this one now, alpha n times. So you see, it's the partial derivative of our function f, which is well defined if it exists. Now, the only thing missing here is the order of the partial derivative, which is as always the sum of all exponents here in the denominator. However, with our multi-index notation, this means we have the absolute value of our multi-index alpha here. And with this, you see, we've reached the goal to get a very nice compact notation for partial derivatives. In other words, you can say d alpha stands for a differential operator for our function f. It immediately tells us how many partial derivatives of which kind we have to perform. Okay, and then I would say, in order to see this, let's look at some examples. And maybe for the examples, let's assume that we have n is equal to 3. And then for example, our alpha could look like this. The first component is a 1, and then we have two zeros. This means that the absolute value, the length of alpha, is equal to 1. So you see, this is very simple, and also alpha factorial is not complicated at all. So in this case, it would be 1 factorial times 0 factorial times 0 factorial. And there you should know that 0 factorial is defined to be 1. It's a useful definition, and in this case, it gives us alpha factorial is equal to 1. Moreover, now we can also look at the monomial x to the power alpha. Now, by definition, it would be x1 to the power 1 times x2 to the power 0 times x3 to the power 0. And there, similarly to the factorial, you should recall that x2 to the power 0 is defined to be 1. In other words, both components x2 and x3 will not occur in the product here. So the monomial is very simple, we just have x1 to the power 1. However, you should see this is only so simple because alpha was chosen as a simple multi-index. In the next example, we will choose a more complicated one. However, before we do that, let's first calculate d alpha of a function f. Now, with the same reasoning as before, with the zeros, we can conclude that x2 and x3 will not occur in our partial derivative. In fact, we already know the order of the partial derivative here is equal to 1. And we also see the only component that remains here in the denominator is x1 with power 1. So in this case, the alpha is simply the partial derivative of f with respect to x1. 
So you see, also here, not complicated at all. Therefore, I would say, let's choose a more complicated alpha now. So maybe now, one, two, and one. Now we see if we add all the components, we get four. Hence, we immediately know the partial derivative here will be of order four. But let's first look at alpha factorial. By definition, it's simply one factorial times two factorial times one factorial. So in this case, what we get out is two. Okay, then we continue to our monomial x to the power alpha, which now, in contrast to before, consists of more components. For example, x2 now has the power 2, and x3 as x1 has the power 1. Okay, then as promised before, let's write down the partial derivative, which should be of order 4. Which means we have d4f here in the numerator. And then we have dx1 once, and then we have dx2 twice. And then finally dx3 once again. And that's it. This is how we can use the multi-index notation to denote partial derivatives. Indeed, this will be very helpful if we want to write down the Taylor polynomial in several variables. More precisely, it will look very similar to the one-dimensional case. And that's of course what we want when we generalize formulas. Therefore, I would say let's meet in the next video when we talk about the Taylor polynomial in multivariable calculus. So have a nice day and bye.